Crash. First of all, don't forget to fill out your evaluations on the class. Following our next keynote speech and a special new product announcement from DJI, just tell us what the heck it is that, that you do and then we'll come see it in the hangar. Thank you very much for your support. We are view fine. We do a well display. Uh, to make it sim sim simple, you get your MDD while you are still watching your phone. And if you haven't checked it yet, we are in the hangar. It's also until 7, so please make sure to come and check out all the awesome stats. Thank you very much. They will have an awesome plaque made out of their name that they'll be able to pick up. Okay, our next keynote, Romeo Dersher, was born and raised in Switzerland and moved to San Jose to work on a NASA space mission. After almost 13 years of working on NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory, doing product management, education, public outreach, and social media, Romeo joined DJI, the global leader in unmanned aerial systems, as the director of education. He advises and educates organizations, industries, governments, and individuals, and intertron attendees on beneficial use, incorporation, and safe integration of unmanned aerial systems. Please welcome DJI's Romeo Dersha. Swiss, because usually people ask me, where are you from? And I say, South Chicago. And now I can't do that. So my name is Romeo Dorsch, I'm the Director of Education at DJI. And uh, DJI, as you know, is the commercial uh, leading manufacturer of commercial products. So uh, I'm really excited to be here. And I'm going to make this a little bit different, uh, this keynote a little bit different, because yesterday, Chris talked about the future and how he sees the possible future in the eyes of 3 I am going to talk today a little bit about what we are right now. And so, let's get started. If you believe the media, I have done it all already. So there is an image of me that circles around, flying a drone, and it's being used in a variety of different articles. In this case, um, I may be responsible for the slaving of a uh, Yemeni's family. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I'm also associated apparently with Umbrella and GoPro. I'm also apparently behind the drone that knocks out the woman. You know, I've been really waiting. I'm really waiting for the day. I'm at the airport and a little boy looks at me and goes, Mommy, it's the bad drone guy. <laughs> Here's a little bit one that's more appropriate. Um, drone attack survivors marched to, to Washington. I'm not sure if I'm the attack team or the other person. So it, it's, it's very confusing. Uh, this one actually I like because the media made me look like a teenage boy. Yes. <laughs> okay, I have to admit. This is the only one that I've actually photoshopped because this is the only picture that I thought would really go well with the heading of drone following the car crashes into her car. It is photoshopped. This one is not real, the other's car. So a little bit about me. I started flying uh, very early on on these quadcopter thingies and uh, uh, in 2013 in February I actually took the first drone of myself and I thought, oh this is so cool. Maybe I can do some cool art with it. And by including myself in the images, I was able to also create perspective. So here I'm standing on top of a big rock uh, with my best friend Mark Johnson, and uh, you can see the size of the wave. But that was not good enough. I started doing panoramas. 
several images, stitching them together, and you have something really art. <coughs> now, uh, I used to work at NASA, and I was doing education and public outreach there. This is actually an image of Las Vegas, taken from the International Space Station. So, while doing STEM outreach, science, technology, engineering, and math, there was one component that was missing. And right now, at PGI, uh, I am actually able to incorporate the missing component, which is A for art. And art is an important element we cannot forget, because science is art, and art is science. That leads me to DJI University. We created a platform to support education. And there are several layers. First of all, we want to educate the new pilots and possible customers of safe behavior and how to use the technology and know about local laws and regulations. We have over 400 events worldwide this year alone. But we also do changing the public perception which is especially true in the United States. The moment you say the word drone, uh, my picture pops up with uh, yet yeah, many families that are being slain. So we need to change public perception. But that's not all. We can also educate industry on how to use the technology and incorporate it into their businesses. And furthermore, we need to work with our government. We need to also educate our local, our city, state, and federal governments on what the technology can and cannot do. And one thing that's really dear to me is the integration of hardware and software into the classrooms. Get the kids and students and teachers and researchers an opportunity to get the hardware into their hands and then also use the software to create applications that we have not even thought of yet. That to me is inspiration. Now, my talk today is about something that happened just a few months ago and it completely changed my life, and you will see why. With the ABC Learning America team, we went into the hidden world, Sound Dog, and what we were trying to do was trying to get a live broadcast out of the jungle inside the world's largest cave in central Vietnam. Not an easy adventure. So, we had to do two tricks. The first trip was a survey trip, because we really needed to figure out, can we do that? Can we actually find a satellite for the live broadcast? And what would it look like to fly a drone inside the cave? So we flew to Hong Kong, and from Hong Kong to Hanoi. And we had a day in Hanoi, and it ended up that my one inspired that I had brought got lost. So I had, in essence, uh, 20 hours to figure out a way to get an inspired. Long story short, we passed. From there, we went on to central Vietnam, and we were greeted in Dong Hoi by the Excellus Adventure team. From there, actually, this, is a, this was the entire team at the time. Three people from ABC, myself, a person from the government, from the Vietnamese government to chaperone us, and uh, somebody local that helped us with the entire project. And Vietnam was exactly the way I had anticipated it to be. These beautiful rivers and lush, big mountains. It was just fantastic. And so using every platform I inspired really allowed me to take beautiful images from perspectives I really didn't expect. So it was time to go into the jungle, and I decided let's put my inspire in the backpack, and I'm just going to carry it because then quickly deploy and fly. In the meantime, the, the lost Inspire had shown up, and so porters were carrying the Inspire in a go professional case into the jungle and through the jungle until we got to the, to the cave. And uh, I actually had a helper who wanted to really be involved and carry my Inspire, so I didn't have to carry anything. Really. <laughs> um, yeah. Here is uh, one of the ABC engineers, Josh, and he's looking for satellite. If he can get a satellite link, that was really one of the main objectives, because without the satellite reception and link to, there is no live broadcast to be done. Looking inside Hang N, which is the third world largest cave, uh, it, it's an amazing field, and Hang N turned out to be the location where we would do the live broadcast from. 
There is another cave called Song Dong, which is even larger, and we decided to do the taping inside Song Dong. Now, being in a cave is, is not really that comfortable because uh, the toilets are in essence buckets, and uh, the toilet paper is there, but then you have to put some rice chips on top of it. All of that is not so bad, but you have that peeping toms in there. <laughs> and this guy was the worst of all because I put my headlamp to the side and I hear this plop sound. So he it, it's dived into the bucket. Needless to say, it did not do my business there. <laughs> now, uh, this picture I want to show because uh, Maria from ABC looks amazing with her socks over her pants, but that was necessary because we had beaches in the water. And I looked like Superman there with my little uh, devices because we were just about to climb into Song Dong with all of our equipment. Now we're already inside the cave, crossing over the river. This was the last time we could take a bath for five days, and it felt really good. The cave is really so large that you sometimes need people to get some sort of perception. So here we put one of our helpers in front of us, and another one way down on top of this structure called the hand of dog. Here I'm flying the DJI Inspire, and this behind me is, is an opening, a dome line. Uh, it's in essence a big hole in the ceiling that lets daylight in. Right below the dome line, about six, seven hundred meters below, is another jungle that grows on the floor of the cave. It's, it's just tremendous. All right, so we decided during the survey trip that we can do a live broadcast. So we went back only two weeks after. And as you can see, the team has grown a little bit. And I also got the help from one of our top pilots, Ferdinand Wold, from Germany. And so we, there was the two of us and uh, many more ABC engineers. So here is a trailer from not only the footage we captured from the first flight, but also from a project we did with Eric Tang uh, just a few months earlier, flying over an active volcano in Iceland. We have sound. After learning discovery, so mammoth, you can probably fly a 747 inside. So we're flying in with drones, an epic live event inside a breathtaking hidden world buried beneath a jungle. This has never happened on my TV, and we're even swimming with 20 million jellyfish in the Pacific. This is unbelievable. Next week, you can see the world's new wonders live on Good Morning America. So that was the promo that was running in, in the United States while we are going into the Song Dong Cave. And uh, before we were going into that cave, I again used our DJI Inspire to capture some of the beautiful scenery of Vietnam. We had a lot of equipment, about 100 cases all together, lights and cables and power generators. And it's really not an easy task to do a live broadcast. On the DJI side, I wanted to make sure that we always had enough equipment in case something would break down. So we had four DJI Inspire ones and three DJI Phantom three professionals with us. This allowed us to have a spare machine per person. Now this time we did not have to track through the jungle, which was awesome because we could load everything into this amazing MI-17 Russian helicopter and then just fly about a mile outside of the cave. Now what was really cool was that uh, while we were loading up the helicopter, almost the entire town came out because they had never seen such a big helicopter, they had never seen drones before. So the kids had a wonderful time looking through uh, our device and seeing what, what their little town looks like from above. And then it was time to fly into the cave area. You can see way in the background there, the entrance to one of the two caves, hang in. This was our second helicopter flight. And of course, this was all coordinated with the pilot, and we are keeping a safe distance. But these are really the shots that you are now getting. Now, this was not a live broadcast. This was tape, um, but still, it's, it's beautiful footage. 
So now we're back inside Hang An, okay? And this is what it looked like when we arrived, and this is what it looked like once we set everything up for a live broadcast. Uh, it's uh, early in the morning in the United States when NBC Good Morning America runs. It's late at night in, in Vietnam, so we had to really lit up the entire cave. All right, now we are actually going into Sandong, and we were using the Phantom 3 to kind of document the descent down this very, very steep wall. And it was just really fascinating because uh, this is what, what it looked like from the ground, and this is what it looks like from, from the drone's perspective. And you can see the, the entrance of, of, of Song Dong up there, and how people are climbing down that really big wall. Even though it's the world's largest caves, there are areas that are so tight that you have to really push yourself through, which also caused some issues with big cases, but with enough force, you get pretty much anything through the buildings. <laughs> Life inside this cave is amazing because it has two areas where there are these openings, and so daylight comes in. But the size of the cave is so big that it has its own weather system. And living in a cave provides you with a completely different experience. Uh, and one thing that was completely different is we had to charge batteries all the time off of power generators, and it was not always a lot of fun. Now here, uh, we flew out of the cave through that big opening and another 500 feet up and looking down. So this is an amazing view. This is a view we cannot have any other way. And it's just breathtaking. So in this morning, a beam of light shines into that cavern. And it just provides you with an out-of-world experience. Here, in the middle of the screen, you see a tiny person on top of a stalagmite. That is ABC's host, Ginger Z, who came with us. And it just gives you an idea of the sheer size of this cavern. And now, flying inside this cavern was just amazing. You can see the DJI Inspire on the left side, while I'm going around orbiting the two of them. And it's just incredible. It looks out of an Avatar movie scene. It's just amazing. Now, oh, this is a good one. It was so humid inside the cave that after every flight, we had to clean up the machines. They were completely drenched in water. We had sand and dust. So the environment was really harsh. But the, the equipment really performed very well. We also never had a flat surface to take off and land from. And most of the time, we had to fly with a helmet on, and we were drenched because it's so hot, except Ferdinand never sweats. And I, on the other hand, always had really nice outlines on my shirt. So this is the second dough line, and I flew very far up, and I took a, a vertical panorama of it. Now, if you look straight down, you can see this huge opening in the ceiling. And this ceiling is big enough to park two 747s inside. Or we have somebody from Airbus here running, we will be able to park one and a half A380s inside there. <laughs> this is what it usually looked like pitch black darkness, and we had to set up our flight machines and everything we needed for a flight just with the headlights on. And way in the background, you can see the light that comes in from the dough line. And then we created this shot. We put Ginger Z on top of this stalactite, line, and then we flew around her. And this was really challenging because it's dark. There is no GPS, and there are a lot of winds inside. Now, from a, tech, from a technical perspective, this was challenging because our DJI equipment had to be connected to the ABC's equipment. And we used a third radio and connected that one through our HDMI out into ABC's equipment, and they could then use the camera. So during the live broadcast, we had three channels available. One channel was for the handheld camera, one channel was for the drone, 
and the third channel is for communications back to the studio in New York. Now it's showtime. We are just about to go live and this huge cloud comes above the area, interrupting our live feed. Meaning, we lost one channel and it was the communication channel. So we had no idea what New York wanted us to do and when we're live. So we were just ready on the edge of our seats. But once in a while we got some little bits of, uh, of communications back in and it all worked out. So I'm going to show you a very short video and uh, that gives you an idea of the kind of footage we got and the beauty of all. And right after that we're going to have a wonderful and very fascinating uh, product announcement. <laughs> We are in central Vietnam, just outside of the hidden world of Song Dong. Song Dong is the world's largest cave system, and what we're doing here is we're writing TV history. Together with an ABC Good Morning America team and their engineers, we will be live broadcasting out of the hidden world of Song Dong. We actually flew into the jungle by means of a helicopter because we had so much equipment. At times, we could see long lines of porters carrying equipment, food, power generators, cables through the thick brush, across rivers, and down into the cave. We had to continue to cross rivers, trek through the jungle, rappel down walls, and make our ways through very narrow areas of the cave. All of this in very high humidity, with constant mist in the air and very dusty conditions. At times, it was pitch black dark inside the cave. We had to be careful. Every step had to be carefully planned as there were cliffs and very sharp rocks. Then we tracked through the first cave, the Hang An Cave, which became, in essence, our home base. George, I am way down here. From the perspective, you can see me about 400 feet below the top of one of the world's largest caverns. It is inside a mountain, inside a jungle, in central Vietnam. And this, I have to be honest with you, has been one of, or the, I would say, most difficult, dangerous, and grittiest assignments I have ever been a part of. We've been staying in these tents. We've been cooking over fires. This, again, is very remote. We are not close to any civilization. This is brand new to our world, the subterranean surreal life that has been revealed, and now you get to be a part of it. Inside the Song Dong Cave, there are two areas that have a big, huge hole in the ceiling, about 300 feet above. Those are called dough lines. And we've been using the DJI Inspire One, as well as the Phantom 3, to see what kind of footage we could get flying inside those massive caves. And both have performed flawlessly. The focus of the trip was to get aerial footage from inside the world's largest cave. However, flying in a cave introduces a lot of challenges, such as no GPS reception. The caves are big enough to create their own climate zones, including clouds and fog, so conditions change constantly. We face temperatures as high as 40 degrees Celsius and extreme humidity up to 95%. Because of the gigantic dimensions of the caves, our depth perception was very limited. Therefore, we had to rely solely on our line of sight and the live view from the camera. The environment was pretty harsh with the humidity, the water, the sand and dust, but the equipment performed flawlessly. Teamwork and working with equipment that provides the capabilities that we needed to do this has been the key in making this a successful event. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm 
to tell you about who's going to make this announcement here for DJI. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about this announcement. And then I need some help in a physical way. I'll explain. Uh, Eric Chang is an award-winning photographer and publisher, and is the director of aerial imaging uh, at DJI and also general manager of the San Francisco office. He publishes webpixel.com, the leading underwater photography community on the web, and writes about his aerial imaging pursuits at skypixel.org. His work as a photographer has been featured at the Smithsonian's Natural History Museum and in many media outlets, including Wired, Outdoor Photography, Nautical Photography, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and others. His video work has been shown on the Discovery Channel, National Geographic Channel, and virtually every news network around the world. Now, I was called a few days ago, and or last week, and asked very privately, confidentially, if there was any way that DJI could make a very special product announcement here at Interjournal. So I thought about this for about one twelfth of a second and said, <laughs> I think so. Let me check with Stacy. She said, fine. Uh, so, um, but since then, what, uh, the way it transpired is that uh, DJI was also going to make this announcement and is going to make the, the announcement at IBC in Amsterdam. IBC is the uh, international uh, broadcasting convention, I think, I'm not sure. IBC, anyway, it's the NAB, the National um, Association of Broadcasters, the equivalent of that uh, huge trade show in the United States, it's in Amsterdam uh, each year and it has 50,000 people. So the idea was they were going to make the announcement there and then at Interdrum. Um, but instead, they decided that with the, the growth and enthusiasm of Interdrum, they decided to make the world premiere here. And then uh, IBC will learn about it tomorrow. So, So, can I have the music please? So, just going to get the music here a little bit. Not that one. Not that one. Not that one. Not, not that one. I got a joke on that. Hail Pop. It's the last one on the list. <laughs>
Earlier this week, we released intelligent flight modes. Uh, these are flight modes for our aerial imaging platform, and they're an aerial toolkit that makes it easier to capture compelling footage without having to manually pilot. So these would be things like point of interest, which is also called orbit, so you can uh, fly around the subject while facing in. Uh, waypoints, um, we make you fly the waypoints first, uh, so you don't autonomously fly into something. Um, intelligent orientation control, uh, these would be like home lock, course lock, uh, modes that sort of abstract the direction the drone is facing. And of course, follow me, uh, very highly requested by folks out there. Um, so these intelligent flight modes are really there to improve the user experience for repeatable, high quality movements. Now on the higher end, DJI's integrated area platform is the Inspire One. And it has a transforming shape, which means that the camera has a full 360 degrees of freedom underneath the drone, and it supports dual operator mode, so you can have a dedicated camera operator as well as a pilot. Um, and it also features, of course, integrated long distance high definition video, which you just saw used in Romeo's presentation for a live broadcast uh, from remote Vietnam. So this is a ready to fly package for prosumers and professionals who are looking to do more professional video capture. And again, it's a very powerful integrated solution. Now the camera on the Inspire One is interchangeable. It's the Zenmuse X3. Now that is also getting stabilized, obviously, and it features a 1 over 2.3 inch sensor. That's the same size sensor that's used in the Phantom 3, and it has the same camera specs. The lens is 94 degrees, it's distortion free, it's like a 20 millimeter those of you who use full-frame cameras. Now, in terms of commercial use, uh, the platforms that we've produced have been so useful that they were found in about 70% of the first 700 FAA Section 333 exemptions. So we, what we've heard is that it's because the drones are readily available, they're reliable, and they produce consistent results. So it really takes the guessing out of aerial imaging. So these are tried and trusted products that people can you know, basically overnight from Amazon. Um, but really, you don't need to look at the products themselves. You should really look at the final output from, from our users. Now, for some people, of course, you might need more than what a Phantom or Inspire One offer. And at the moment, it pretty much requires building something custom. So if you need to carry a larger camera, like a GH4 or, you know, Canon 5D Mark III or something, it, it really requires that you build or have built for you a custom hexacopter or octocopter, a heavier lift vehicle. And you know, these things, unfortunately, don't give us the things that we sort of take for granted now, like intelligent batteries, um, pre-configured radios that have dedicated controls for cameras, uh, remote control of camera settings, you know, even something as simple as changing shutter speed on the fly, um, integrated long-range, high-definition video transmission, ease of deployment, sort of the list goes on. So deploying and operating a setup like this can be fairly complicated, and you know we are very frequently used on film sets, and you can imagine on a film set, any of you who have been on one with one of these, um, you, there's a lot of setup. You know, somebody, an assistant, has to go pick the rig up, check all the camera settings, check to make sure it's in focus, and then once you get it in the air, you're sort of hoping that you haven't accidentally changed any settings. And of course, during during this whole time, I mean, you better nail it because the director's looking as well as everybody else on the set. So DJI is actively developing in this space, and for the folks who require custom setups, um, there it will be a product, well, we're gonna announce, pre-announce right now, Lightbridge 2, and there will be more information about Lightbridge 2 at IBC. So you don't get everything here in Intergrown, uh, you don't get Lightbridge 2. But their specs will be out very soon, and it's our high-definition, long-range uh, wireless communications protocol. Now, one thing that was really interesting that many of you noticed is that in February, we joined the Micro Four Thirds Consortium. So the Micro Four Thirds Consortium is a standard, it's a standards group that emphasizes compact size, high quality imaging, and interchangeable lens type cameras. So the question is, why did DJI join the Micro Four Thirds Consortium? Well, if you get larger sensors, Micro Four Thirds sensors are definitely definitely larger, which means better image quality per pixel. So 16 megapixels on one, 16 megapixels on a smaller sensor actually makes a very, very large difference. So this is sort of busting a megapixel myth. And I'm trying to go forward here. There we go. Um, 
Now, of course, there's lower noise because the sensors are much larger. Also, because the sensors are larger, you get bigger apertures. So you've seen these beautiful shots with sh a shallow depth of field. This is very important for the creative use or creative capture in imaging. And of course, it's mirrorless, which means that there are no unnecessary optics. You don't have a mirror, a viewfinder, these sorts of things, um, which gives it an emphasis on compact design. So this is a micro four thirds mount without an attached lens. Uh, mirrorless systems like that, that are in the micro four thirds standard feature a very shallow rear flange length. And what that means is lenses can have their rearmost element very, very close to the sensor. So it's possible to have small, high quality lenses for relatively large sensors. You can imagine this would be important for aerial use. So in the next evolution of aerial imaging, what we are announcing is the Zenmuse X5. Zenmuse X5 is the world's first stabilized micro four thirds aerial camera. Now it's three axis stabilized using the Zenmuse gimbal technology. It features a micro four thirds size sensor that captures still images at 16 megapixels to JPEG or Adobe DNG RAW and 4K video at 24 and 30 frames per second. Of course, the Zenmuse X5 is designed to be mounted on that interchangeable lens mount on the Inspire 1, making it the first ready-to-fly aerial camera with a micro four-thirds sensor. So being able to mount a micro four-thirds camera on an Inspire 1 is only possible because we removed all of the unnecessary elements in the camera. So this is the same thing that we've been doing since the Vision Plus, which is removing things that are used for the ground, like a grip, viewfinder controls. I mean, those of you who have, who have used a land-based micro four-thirds sensor with the lens attached have seen how heavy they can be. And in fact, the ones that are commonly used in the air require large tables and heavier lift platforms. So this, the Zenmuse X5 weighs 1.16 pounds. Now that's with the lens <coughs> and is about five and a half inches square. So Again, let's take a moment to just look at what makes Micro Four Thirds sensors so exciting. It's really all about size. And the Phantoms and the Zenmuse X3 that were on the Inspire one use one over 2.3 inch sensors. This is a very standard sensor size for action cameras and smaller compact cameras. If you look at this, I hope you can read it here, but you can see that the, the, large, the biggest blue um, area is the size of a Micro Four Thirds sensor, which is over eight times larger than the sensors that are in some of the smaller compact cameras, including the DJI band. Now, what that means is we have very big pixels. And big pixels are important because there's more surface area to collect photons. And it's all about collecting photons. And if you have more surface area to collect photons, that generally means that you get higher dynamic range. This camera is capable of capturing 12.8 stops of a dynamic range, which is very competitive. And also larger sensors capture both stills and video with very little noise. Now, of course, we need lenses for Micro Four Thirds systems. And accompanying the X5 is DJI's Micro Four Thirds F1.7 aspherical lens. This has a 72 degree field of view, so it's like a 30 millimeter lens uh, equivalent. And it features very sharp aspherical lens elements, and it's lightweight, weighing about a quarter of a pound. The Zenmuse X5 supports additional lenses. These are the, the current lenses that it will support. And they, it supports the Olympus uh, 12mm f2.0 lens, the Panasonic 15mm f1.7 lens, and the Olympus 17mm f1.8 lens. Now, we will have additional lens support in the future. It, of course, has to fit in the gimbal. Um, the other thing that's very important for those of you who use gimbals is that Gimbals with cameras need to be balanced. So the way that we are solving this is, is by selling accessory hoods for these lenses that, when attached, center the, you know, place the center of gravity in a way such that the gimbal remains balanced. So that creates a properly balanced payload for the X5. Oh, I didn't get to see that. Okay, 
So, let's talk about Zen Music Gimbal technology very briefly. Now, of course, it's a Zen Music Gimbal, so it incorporates DJI's class leading camera stabilization technology. So, here are the specs. The controllable range is negative 90 degrees in pitch, which is straight down to plus 30 degrees, which is a little bit up. Can someone tell me where I'm supposed to point this? and minus 320 degrees, that's almost a full circle in each direction. Now the max controllable speed is 120 degrees a second in pitch and 180 degrees a second in pan. That means it can turn a full 360 degrees in three seconds. Now what's uh, pretty exciting is that the accuracy is 0.02 degrees during stabilization. Now that just sounds like a number I'm throwing out, but the reason it's important is that's sub-pixel stabilization. So as the Zen News is stabilizing, the amount of motion that you're getting during that stabilization is less than one pixel's worth on the resulting image. And this practically means that you should not see stabilization artifacts in your resulting uh, video. Now we have an advanced imaging processor in the Zen News X5. On the photography side, we've already talked about this some, but we have 16 megapixels still captured in JPEG and Adobe DNG RAW. Uh, our ISO range is 100 to 25,600. We burst at up to 7 frames per second. And we have advanced noise reduction because of that large sensor and the processor. And we have some special shooting modes. We have auto exposure bracketing, HDR, panorama modes, and time lapse modes. So you're starting to see this sort of feel like a camera. You know, the normal cameras that you use on, on the ground typically have all these modes. Like on the video side, we shoot at 4K at 30 and 24 frames per second. We are broadcast ready for shooting using H.264 compression uh, and the main profile of 4.1. And we have advanced 3D denoising for about two stops of lower light shooting. Now, 3D denoising is interesting because if you imagine standard noise reduction on a still frame, all you have are the, the pixels in that frame from which to calculate how you want to reduce the noise. But in 3D denoising, you are also able to look at history. So you can look at previous frames and analyze those in conjunction with your current frame to reduce noise. So when combined with the mechanical stabilization that we have in our gimbals, you can do some really interesting work. So what this all means is that the X5 is a pretty compelling professional grade camera. The photos look great, and that, that clean micro four third sensor enables you to capture shots that are difficult to reproduce like this one, you know, shooting straight into the sun at sunset. We have advanced capture modes like bursts of seven frames per second, other things that I've mentioned that allow you to nail the shot, really to tell a story. And really, of course, what we're trying to do here is create tools that allow you tell stories. Now I mentioned there's a panorama mode in the Zenius X5. In this mode, the gimbal automatically moves the camera to take multiple pictures so that the optimal overlap percentage is present in, in a, a series of pictures to allow you to stitch your gimbals in post. And of course, as with all Inspire One based aerial imagery, long distance flights are easy because LightBridge is integrated, so you have the long range reliable wireless connectivity and HD previous uh, light. I've been talking a lot about cameras, but really what we need to remember is that the Zen Muse X5 is an aerial camera and it's integrated with the Inspire One. So this system is really designed you to let you seamlessly position a micro four thirds camera in space arbitrarily. And of course, the camera is only as good as the storage you are going to tell with it. And so what we have here is really the unlocking third dimension for large sensors so that you can tell your, your, your stories from a new perspective. Now on the wireless control side, the Zen Muse X5 is controlled in the same way that other DJI cameras are controlled. So this would be using ergonomic physical controls on the remote controller and also using our best in-class app uh, for iOS and Android, which is DJI Go. 
So using DJI Go, users have full control of both flight and camera settings. So all aspects of video and still capture can be controlled from DJI Go. This includes shutter speed, ISO, capture modes like burst mode, you know, uh, auto exposure, bracketing, things like that. Um, and also new for the Zenmuse X5, you can also control aperture and focus. So suddenly you have full control over a camera, uh, including things like aperture, as we didn't have before, and of course focus. And speaking of focus, I want to talk about the aerial autofocus system. So because this system now can focus, it, it is the world's first aerial autofocus system. It uses high-speed contrast-based autofocus. We have a 256 zone touchable AI. So to focus while you're using DJI Go, you just tap on the screen and it will focus there. There are also autofocus and manual modes uh, that you can use to assist uh, focus. Of course, one is fully manual focus. You can use one of the controls or the interface on the screen to slide focus around. Um, we also have focus assist mode. This is as automatic zooming when you manually focus. And we have focus peaking. Now, those of you who are shooting video on the high end will be used to focus peaking. It's a way for us to tell you what's in focus based on overlays, other than you, you know, rather than you having to just try to find, see what's sharp. And we previewed this uh, a while ago, but we're also announcing today DJI Focus. Now, this is a wireless follow focus system. Now, this is a versatile wireless follow focus system that can be used with any, you know, any motors you want, but it can also be plugged into the Inspire One remote. So what that means is we're providing camera lens functionality for wireless focus using a physical controller that can be plugged into the Inspire remote. So, you know, you can now have a pilot, a dedicated camera operator, and in fact, if you wanted, you could have a dedicated person holding focus while plugged into one another radius. Now, the wireless signal isn't uh, standalone when used with the Inspire. So we're using the Inspire One's uh, light bridge signal, which means that you can do follow focus as far as 1.2 miles or further, uh, which is our rated range. DJI Focus is, uh, is going to be available as an add-on to the Inspire One package. It'll be uh, 8 dollars Now, the Zenmuse X5 shoots high-quality 4K video. If you want to look at some of these video frames, you can see that they look different than most of the, the aerial videos that we've been seeing uh, posted to YouTube. Specifically, you can see that the background is blurred. Now, this is because we have a large line of, you know, larger sensor and big apertures. And uh, so the image quality is better, and the, there's a very shallow depth of field that's possible. Now, of course, aerial imaging platforms are really designed to move. In this tracking shot of a rally car, the second operator is controlling the camera. But you can imagine that focus could also be pulled by a third operator using that DJI focus unit. Okay, so here's a summary of the specs. We're using a micro four thirds sensor in the Zenmuse X5. It shoots at 16 megapixels for stills in JPEG and PNG. And it shoots in 4K video at 30 24 frames per second. Uh, with video bit, bit rates of 60 uh, megabits per second. So, the Zenmuse X5 is the first integrated aerial imaging system that features a micro four thirds sensor and interchangeable lenses and full remote camera and lens control. And Inspire One has always been a fantastic tool on sets because of its small size, ease of deployment, and dual operator support. But cinematographers often have steeper requirements for image quality, especially if they're trying to integrate aerial footage into uh, productions that use something like a RET or higher end cinema cameras. So we have another announcement that will make the Inspire One even more appropriate for high end professional filmmaking. And that is the Zenmuse X5R. Okay. Like its sibling, the X5R uses a micro four thirds sensor and lenses, but the R stands for something very special. Can anyone, anyone guess? Red. It stands for RAW. So the Zenmuse X5R is the world's smallest 4K lossless cinematic camera. So it shoots 4K video 
to the open file format that's used for digital cinema files, which is called Cinema DMG. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Cinema DMG, it's a video format that records each frame in its own individual raw DMG file. So what does that mean? Well, it means that you can capture the highest, qual highest quality possible by storing everything coming off of the sensor in raw format. So all digital cameras shoot in raw, but most digital cameras will do an in-camera conversion to a format like JPEG, which, which we see as a picture. So what we're doing here is recording all of the data in RAW, which can lead, of course, to more complex workflows, but what you get in return is a tremendous amount of power and image quality. You're getting lossless video. It's like shooting a 4K image 30 times a second to RAW. Actually, that's exactly what it is. Um, and, and of course, those of you who are still photographers know the benefits of shooting in RAW. You can do white balancing in, in post. There's tremendous latitude for doing uh, color grading, and what we're doing is I'm giving you the ability to retain that information during capture. So the Zenmuse so X5R actually records two video streams at the same time. It records raw lossless cinema DNG, and it records this to a proprietary 512 gigabyte mini solid state disk. It also records a proxy QuickTime movie using H.264 compression to the micro SD card. So raw video is captured at an incredible bit rate. Remember, we were capturing about 60 megabits a second to micro SD card. Well, at RAW, we were capturing up to 2.4 gigabits per second. So this is more than 300 megabytes per second of, of RAW footage. Um, now, the proxy videos are very useful because in RAW workflows, they can be challenging to work with Cinema DNG. So the idea is that we're recording a proxy video which is the same quality as you would get if you were shooting the Zenmuse X5, and you can basically start editing immediately using those files. Okay, so as I mentioned before, raw workflows can be quite complicated. So DJI's new Cinelite application is, can be used to apply our color lookup table to capture raw video sequences. You can also do color grading using Cinelite. And what Cinelite does will then export back to Cinema DMG or also to Apple ProRes or TIFF sequences. And of course, I talked about proxy sequences which are captured. Um, so the idea is you can go through this workflow while you're editing the proxies. So in order to take advantage of the X5R's fantastic sensor and raw recording capabilities, we have uh, created a new logarithmic color space called D-Log, which is what the X5R reports to in, in raw video. So the D-Log color space gives filmmakers the most flexibility in color grading in post. So the video captured in D-Log, as in all log modes for video, is low contrast and desaturated out of the camera. But with a bit of grading, videos can easily take on whatever look you're going for in your production. So you have an Audi here driving, driving along a bridge, and you can suddenly make it cruise in the warmth of like a hazy late afternoon or something like that. Now, capturing raw video in D-Log gives professional editors what they need to fulfill their creative desires. So if you look at the specs for the Zenmuse X5R, we're shooting in lossless cinema DNG at 4K at 30 to 24 FPS. Bit rates average 1.7 gigabits per second and peak at 2.4 gigabits per second. We're capturing those dual video streams, cinema DNG and a QuickTime Movie Proxy, and we're recording to an integrated removable 512 gigabyte mini SSD. The Zenmuse X5 and the X5R will be supported also by DJI's SDK. This is our software development kit. Now this will give developers control of the X5 and the X5R and access to the media that it captures. So third-party developers will be able to access the most powerful integrated aerial imaging platform on the market and write custom software and some apps against it. Okay, enough talking. I want to show sample video. Now, this sample video was captured both using the X5 and the X5R. And do we have audio? 
Sorry, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Here we go, Matt. Here we go. I forgot the most important slide. 